Danke viel, Miles Meyer. Und äh, vielen Dank ähm, auf alle hier. Ähm, <lacht> wir freuen uns sehr, ähm, dass es gibt so viel Interesse in Market Gardening, in Ecological Farming und alles. So. Okay, jetzt noch muss ich in Englisch. Um, okay, so. I'm just making sure my microphone works. Good. Thank you all so much. This has just been amazing to be welcomed by all of you here. And it really is very meaningful to us. And we're thrilled to be able to learn from so many of you and to share what we've experienced over the past 13 years of farming. So. Absolutely. So we're going to talk mostly about our farm and about the principles of farming at, with our farm as an example. So a little bit about us, first of all. Um, so this is the most of the fields from Singing Frog's farm. We are about an hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge and San Francisco. The property, and I have to check because it's all different numbers for me, the land is about 3.5 hectare but the actual fields are about 1.1 hectare, okay? So it's not so much land. Um, we've been working on the land since 2007. We didn't start off with the no-till and the ecological. We started off with full tillage. We'll talk about that a little bit. About 45% of our products, our vegetables, go out through our CSA. We started out as a CSA farm, and that is really where our heart is. We love that. About another 45% go out to our farmer's markets. So that is 90% that goes direct to the end consumer. About 8% goes out to two restaurants we have a very close relationship with. And then only 2% goes out through a food hub. It's a kind of wholesaler, um, but that still stays in the Bay Area, within the San Francisco greater area. So without that, 98% of our food stays within about 20 kilometers of our farm. And for us, that's really important. Um, let's see how much um, we are selling off of our farm. Uh, I had to translate these numbers. So uh, we, we sell about $110,000 per acre. And translated, that's about 220 euro per hectare. Um, so that's how many vegetables and fruits we are selling off of our property. Um, we have about five to eight employees, aside from Paul and myself, working on the farm. Um, more like eight or nine uh, in August and September, and more like four or five in uh, January. And it's actually more than that, but there are many people who are part-time, who have other jobs, so we just break it down if, if everyone was full-time. Um, our climate, um, we have a Mediterranean climate, um, so we are very dry in the summertime and then we start our rains in the winter. We actually had our first serious rain last week, um, but we have had uh, our first frost for quite a while. So the rain um, we had last week was the first rain since early April. So no <laughs> rain for the rest of April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Yeah. until mid-November was the next rainfall we had since early April. Yeah, and we had about five centimeters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were colder than you guys yesterday morning. We were negative five degrees yesterday morning. So we do get, I know you're thinking California, you're thinking the surfers and being out there in our bikinis, not so much. <laughs> But, and then in the summertime, we will usually hit about 38 degrees centigrade once um, for a few days in the summer. But it's it's... A pretty moderate temperature. One intriguing challenge we have, just so you know, is we always have our first killing frost early in September. And then in late September and October, we always have a heat wave that comes through and it gets up to around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So 37, 38, 38, 37. It'll do 38 in the daytime and then down to like negative one at night and 37 day, negative two at night, 38, negative one. Yeah, that's our October for us. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let's Oops. continue on. Oh, we're both doing it. <laughs> We call this two cooks in the kitchen. Okay, um, another view of our farm, just so you get an overview. It's shaped like a piece of pizza. The, the top of the crust of the pizza is this hillside that has oaks on it, and it comes down long here. We're coming to the very end. Our neighbor is a 140-acre, how many hectare? Oh, 
um, 80 hectare? So, yeah, 80. 80 hectare. Oh, no, so um, 60, 60 hectare six, vineyard. Sorry. Okay, vineyard on this side. And this is the majority of our fields coming down here. Someone asked earlier, why are we called Singing Frogs Farm? We have choruses of frogs. We have over six ponds, one, two, three, four, five, and six up there. So we have quite a lot of these little Pacific chorus frogs that are very loud. Okay. So I wanna start in by talking a little bit about the story of soil. And of course you all understand soil very well, but it's nice to always have a different view so we can have more language and more ideas about how to share what we know with the greater world. Because as a farmer doing this unique kind of farming, a large part of our job is education, as many of you have found out. We have to talk and share and educate our consumers and our politicians about how we are farming. So soil is air, water, and mineral, and the organic matter. And this is that critical component that we are all concerned with. The organic matter, where the carbon is, and all the organisms, etc. Um, if you didn't have organic matter, what you have is a beach or a sand dune, right? Just water, air, and mineral. There's no life. In fact, that's what Mars has. So if you think about all the planets in our solar system, they all have chemistry, but only one has biology. And yet, since World War II, our, our focus on agriculture has been about the chemistry. We have spent all of this time for the past 80 years thinking about the chemistry of plants and the chemistry of soil and not the biology. And yet every planet out there has chemistry. It's only us that has the biology. So we really have to change how we approach life, how we approach food production and agriculture and soil and begin to bring that biological component in, that life component. As many of you already know, tillage is one of the major practices that reduces the organic matter level in the soil. And that's a quote from the FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. So it's you know very well documented science. Um, when they mention this, what they're talking to and referring to is the many different components of how tillage destroys soil. One of those is the chemical way it destroys it, which is the very act of tilling up the soil is breaking all the aggregates into smaller and smaller pieces. And so as the soil pieces get smaller, there's more surface area to volume ratio, and that act of tilling mixes in oxygen, and the higher surface, to, surface area to volume ratio allows more carbon and nitrogen to be released from the soil, combining with the oxygen to form carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. So the very act of tillage takes the carbon and nitrogen that you need as a farmer, removes it from the soil, and puts it in the atmosphere as greenhouse gases. A huge double negative. In addition, tillage also destroys the biology of the soil, not just the chemistry. A great quote from our own USDA, United States Department of Ag, tilling the soil is the equivalent of an earthquake, hurricane, tornado, and forest fire occurring simultaneously to the world of soil organisms. Simply stated, tillage is bad for the soil. That's pretty blunt. That's a very direct and very powerful statement from our own agricultural department that still promotes tillage in all kinds of ways. <laughs> That's the problem. So what's happening, right? The tillage is coming in and it's breaking up soil, breaking up habitat. There are billions and billions and billions of organisms in a little teaspoon of soil. We still don't know most of those organisms. We haven't named them, we haven't identified them, we don't know what they do, but there is so much life in there. And the act of tilling it up just blows it up and destroys, that so destroys the life in the soil. Another way that tillage affects soil is just through the sheer erosion effect. And erosion is often something you can't see. You might see a gully form, but what about just a little bit of erosion every single year for hundreds of years? So this is a great study done again by the USDA, and they were looking down in, um, in the Appalachian, Tennessee area. They had about 16 farms, or no, eight farms. They had four farms doing no-till, a mechanized no-till. This is large production monoculture. And they had four farms doing moldboard plow over four years. And what they found was in the erosion here, take a look at moldboard plow. They had 4,700 pounds of soil loss per acre per year. So we're at like 2,000 plus kilos, 2,200 kilos of soil per half hectare. So we have to... 
I'll leave it in the acres and... <laughs> okay, the really important part is look at the no-till. Same crop, same soil, same valley, different management practices. Six pounds of soil loss per acre per year. This is 700 times more soil loss. That means you could farm this field for 700 years using no-till and have the same amount of erosion after 700 years of farming no-till as one year of farming this with moldboard plow. And in case you think I'm using numbers that help prove my point, I want you to know that this number was half our national average during the study dates. In the late 70s, early 80s, our national average in the United States was 9,400 pounds of soil loss per acre per year. This moldboard plow field was a good field. These four farms, they were good farms by the national average. And they are still 700 times more soil loss. Just to give you an idea, that much soil loss, it's about a 13th of an inch. You can barely see it on an acre. So after a few years, you might get that little quarter centimeter. After a decade, you might get that centimeter, but you wouldn't really see it going away. It's such a slow thing, but it's a huge amount of soil loss. I got it. <laughs> I'm actually just going to even add there, our farm is a very interesting example because our whole farm, I remember I talked about that pizza slice, as you go down to the tip, bottom tip of the pizza, you're going downhill, and we have some ponds at the bottom there, they're seasonal ponds, so they dry out during our dry summer, and you can see the erosion. The prior farmer there, he told us when we moved onto the property, he said this is a great system, because every autumn you can come in here, when the pond is dry, take your tractor, scoop all of the silt from last year, put it back on your fields, till it in, put in your winter cover crop. Isn't that great? Well, Paul did that for the first couple of years until we started changing our system. At this point, there's nothing going down in those fields. So we have a beautiful example on our farm of that working. So if we look at how much of the total soil organic matter and soil carbon has been lost from our agricultural soils, it's roughly two-thirds of all the soil organic matter and soil carbon has been lost from our agricultural soils in just the past 70 or 80 years since the mechanization with the tractor and massive efficiencies where we're farming the same fields year after year. So really what we're saying is we do not have another 100 years of soil carbon left to keep farming the same way. Something has to give. Something has to change. So in the U.S., which is actually a pretty good um, reflection of global numbers. But before humans were involved, arable land, healthy arable land that Mother Nature had been tending for a thousand years, had between six and 10% organic matter. As soon as humans move in and humans begin plowing and disking and, and farming, that topsoil drops rapidly. And today in the US, we have between zero and 3% organic matter. And in California, we have a whopping 1% organic matter as our state average. It's down to that. It's been going down every year. I don't know if you've said, but 57% of soil organic matter is carbon. So you can actually just have these numbers and say, you know, 3 to 5% uh, soil carbon and 0 to 1.5% and and there. And just remember, SOM, so soil organic matter. We'll keep using that acronym. Got it. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> talking about our farm now. So as we have progressed, we really focus on the soil. We focus on not doing any tillage of any sort. If you've seen any of our presentations, we love going through these principles. And when we have farmers, gardeners, you know, policymakers on our farm or we're talking to, we like coming back to these because they're really simple. In fact, we did a great presentation two years ago at a local conference with a, a, a rancher named Gabe Brown, who's very well known in regenerative ranching. He has 3,000 acres, so about 1,500 hectare of cattle in North Dakota, um, which is pretty... Uh, rural and north in the United States. And we did a presentation doing number one on three acres of vegetable in Northern California and on 3,000 acres with cattle in North Dakota. And it was really great to see we were using the same principle but different management. So I think everybody can use these no matter if they have one very small garden bed or 
3,000 acres. So <laughs> first one, disturb the soil as little as possible. Paul just talked about why we don't want to disturb the soil. Um, and I'm going to let you talk about it. And it's actually been interesting because there's been a lot of studies how to bring back soil organic matter through agriculture, right? Because agriculture has been one of the great reasons we've lost soil organic matter. How do we bring it back? So in University of California, Davis, they had at least one study, there's been many, and also the Rodale Institute had another set of studies. They're using conventional or low input ag or organic agriculture. Here was conventional or organic animal based and organic legume based. And what they're looking at is the percentage, um, the starting and ending of the trial and the organic matter levels in the soil after 10 years. And here you have typical ag soils are between that one and 3%, that yellow range. However, the average of US agricultural soils in 1920 was 6 to 8%, and you're way up there above the green, actually. So it's interesting to see that conventional, you pretty much, if you have, I mean, Rodale Institute's really good at farming, so they made their conventional actually get a little bit better after 23 years. That's good. But when you get into the organic, you see greater increases, right? You have greater increases from the organic because the organic is trying to have that cover crop that helps feed the soil in winter so that you reduce the damage from tillage. But none of these systems, even after 23 years, have gotten remotely close to where it used to be before humans intervened. Well, Singing Frogs Farm, even after just five years, we can bring our organic matter back to where Mother Nature used to have it. Not a hard thing to do. So I think the point of that is we have to think outside the box. Don't think little small increments. Think about getting back to what Mother Nature intended. And here's a great example. So, you know, when we first started farming, we weren't honestly the best farmers. So, so this is an example of some, uh, one of our beds that we had very early on, our first year or two. When we started out, our soil organic matter was 2.4%, so our soil carbon 1.4%. Um, and very quickly, as soon as we started changing, we saw we were increasing our soil organic matter by about a percentage point a year. Not 15 years, not 20 years, but about a year. And other farmers who have taken on from us and followed our methodology are very much finding the same, such that depending upon our field, you know what, I, I would actually say we're between about 8 and 13% yeah, at about a 15 centimeter depth. Yep. Oh, there we go, 15 to 30 centimeter depth. So that's a, a soil carbon of 4.6 to 6.5%. And that's where we're farming now. Um, and I can tell you that this is a different story to be farming here. Your plants are happier, they're more resistant, their immune systems are robust and strong. Um, so even if you have one of those large temperature swing days, they can make it through. They're dealing with pests better and so forth. So this is again two different soil samples taken this past summer in August. And all we did was go to our fence and go 50 meters on one side of the fence to the vineyard and 50 meters on our side of the fence to field three. Those two soils are 100 meters apart. This is what our soil used to look like in the beginning. And that's what it looks like now after a decade of doing no-till farming. Again, that depth, 15 to 30 centimeters. And this is a wonderful example of having just harvested a chicory. This is the stem, so it's really only like one inch. You're looking straight down on the soil and you can see all the earthworms and life around that one chicory stem. Well, that bed had 240 chicory plants in it. And 240 of those were harvested for that weekend's farmer's markets in CSA. And the amount of life that we could visually see in the soil was astounding. And then you start to think about, what if I had a BCS walk behind tractor and I just drive through it till it all under? It's devastating to till things under. So this is one of those examples where you suddenly see how much life there is, and that's only the life that you can see with your eyes. That isn't all the life that you can't see, the microscopic life as well. So I think we did the first one pretty well. The second principle, <laughs> don't want to kill that life. Uh, keep living plants in the soil as often as possible, right? Um, and the four basic steps, why we want to. So this is the other side of that equation of if you're tilling and you're taking that carbon out and you're killing that life, well, here's the other side. So your plant is photosynthesizing. 
You know, it's got its chlorophyll. It's taking the CO2 in through the holes, through the pores. It's taking the C off, the carbon. It's releasing the oxygen again. That carbon becomes glucose, one of your most basic building blocks of life. Then it is resynthesizing that glucose into a myriad of different carbon-based products, more complicated sugars and carbohydrates and amino acids and proteins and so forth and so on, waxes and fats. Um, and then we've got exudation here. That is pushing many of those products of photosynthesis with that carbon down through the roots into the soil. Depending on the plant, depending on the season, depending on the, how healthy it is, its stresses and so forth, anywhere from 20 to 70% of that carbon that the plant is capturing, it's pushing out into the soil. And that's what we want. That is the humification um, feeding the soil. That is why we want to have as many green photosynthesis synthesizing plants in the ground as often as possible. Now this is fun. This is it in a petri dish. This is a little root hair coming down here and it is pushing out liquid sun, root exudate into that petri dish. So that's just food for all of the biology in the soil. And that biology in the soil takes it in, reconstitutes it, recombines it and sends it back to the plant in the form of its own manures um, from those from the biology in the soil, and they have that relationship, that symbiotic relationship. But that is what initiates the whole process. That's taking that sunlight and feeding our planet Earth. Um, so this is from um, uh, USDA National Resource Conservation Service, but it's just a good basic soil food web. What's happening here with these plants? They're exudating, they're feeding the bacteria and the fungi, which are feeding all the next level of organisms, your nematodes, your protozoas, your fungi, um, so forth and so on, and just going up the food chain to your larger animals. So pretty basic, but just to say that. Um, this is, you saw some of the samples that Paul showed you from our neighbor. This is uh, on our neighbor's property. Um, go for it. Yeah, so I'm over in the vineyard. First of all, walking there was just dust clouds coming up because there's no cover. And this is actually, so if you think about this vineyard, um, they do a cover crop in winter, and they have a perennial crop, the vineyard, the grapes. So really, it's only tilled in the spring and tilled once in the fall, and then they sow a cover crop. So it's pretty minimal impact, but getting that soil block out was challenging. That soil block was a lot like a hunk of concrete. It was very challenging. Go over to our field three. This is late July. Sink the shovel in. And what we pull out is like chocolate cake. The difference is this almost falls apart in my hand. Our chocolate cake soil is so light and so fluffy, I'm really delicately carrying it from the field to the water. Well, here's our soil in the water, and here's the vineyard soil on the left. The vineyard soil it begins to fall apart immediately. This was the one that was like a concrete rock that I couldn't get out of the ground. But when you put it in water, it has no ability to hold together because there's no biology in that soil that it's excreting glomulins and other supermolecules which would hold the soil together. This is a test that you can do at home that really demonstrates tons of biological activity that's excreting glomulins and supermolecules to hold that soil together versus absolutely no biology and the soil is completely falling apart as it sits in water. And this is critical. I have to say, this, this, um, our soil block, I was very delicate when I handled it because it could fall apart in my hands. But in water, nothing happens. It sat there for another four days and still didn't lose anything. Four days later, it looked just like this. It's just the water got a little brown. It made right. tea, nice tea. No, no, <laughs> this one. This one was no, 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 but just the, 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 the there yes. were no particles. Right. And this one was gone in five minutes. Five minutes, it was sand on the bottom. Well, one of the drought years that we had back in 2010, the last rainfall of 2010 was February 4th. There was no rain for all of February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, until October 22nd was the very first rainfall since February 4th. That October 22nd rainfall was 13 inches, so we're at 4, 8, 12, so 31 centimeters in 36 hours. And that was the first rainfall since February 4th to October 22nd. Which soil do you want to have? <laughs> Simple as that. 
Exactly. Okay, so continuing back with um, wanting to have a photosynthetic capture all the time, um, we you know, have an artificial system, but we're having three to eight sequential economic crops in any one bed in a 12-month cycle, and that's how we'll do that. And often you'll actually have multiple crops in one bed. They're all cover crops, <laughs> and they're all economic. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> This just sort of continues on, growing as many different species of plants as practical. We don't want to grow an acre of broccoli and then an acre of broccoli and then an acre of broccoli. We want to rotate through as many as possible. We grow about 70 different um, crops uh, per year. Um, but this really goes back to having that diversity in your plant species. The North American prairie grass system has over 500 species of plants spread throughout. It's amazing the diversity within these fields. 85% of the vegetative biomass is below ground, out of sight. The root mass of a natural native prairie is so much greater than the above ground biomass. And 60% of the total net primary productivity occurs below ground. Yes, all of this is capturing sunlight, but there's far more happening below ground where the exudation occurs to feed the biology, to bring more nutrients into the entire system of the prairie. So I think these kinds of numbers are so critical for us to all recognize how much is happening beneath our feet. The vast majority of life happens beneath our feet. And the only way we feed that is through maximizing the sunlight capture, maximizing photosynthetic capture so that we can have as much root exudation into the ground as possible. So crop diversity also allows for climate resilience. I can say that we've had crop failures every single year. But if we have 70 to 100 different species that we're growing, and each species we might grow between two and 15 crops of it each year, then we can have crop failures, and it doesn't really change our bottom line, our economic returns. We've had something fail every single year, or two or three or five things fail every year, and yet our revenue has continued on the exact same trajectory. So there's no big losses and boom years and losses. We're very stable economically, despite, because of the diversity. And with those two or five, two to five complete losses, we also have a few crops that are just tremendous and we get so much more from than we were anticipating. So it goes both ways. So this is a example that was mentioned earlier this morning in a few presentations about multi-cropping or intercropping. We love to do this with many different species um, of vegetables. This is an example of the big Romanesco cauliflower, the cauliflower that makes a spiral pattern. It's beautiful, but the plants are huge, um, very large plants. So when you transplant out the transplants of this Romanesco cauliflower, we do it 24-inch uh, spacing. So again, we got 24-inch spacing, two lines. <laughs> I want to keep going. Um, and once you transplant them out, you can look down, and the 90% of the bed is bare soil. And you think, well, that's going to be a month until those cauliflower plants grow up and fill in. That's a month that I have all this bare soil between the plants. Why not put some lettuces in and take advantage of that? So in this picture, I have 100% crop cover of cauliflower and 70% cover of lettuces. So 1.7 crops in the given area during the time. What's happening? The lettuces are helping maximize sunlight capture and maximize root exudation. The, sun, the lettuces are also covering and protecting the soil, which reduces weeds and increases soil moisture, which for us in the dry Mediterranean climate is a great thing. So we can increase soil moisture content and decrease watering by having more crops there, which seems so contrary to what people think. Oh, if you have more plants, you need more water. But it's not always the case. If you do it right, these plants are shading the soil, maintaining higher moisture levels in the soil by protecting it and covering it. As they grow together, the cauliflower begins to close canopy, shading and giving a light windbreak and shade to lettuces right at the peak of the lettuce harvest. So the lettuce becomes very tender and flavorful from having a little bit of a sun and windbreak by the cauliflower. The lettuces harvest out. The cauliflower now closes canopy and grows up, and you get the harvest of cauliflower as well. So it's a great way to increase overall yields. This is actually about three weeks after transplant, and then 
Two weeks later, we harvest, and this was the morning. We had just harvested out the lettuces, and now the cauliflower has closed canopy, and a month later, we get the cauliflower harvest as well. So this is what I just went over, some of these ideas. A quick crop for us are things like lettuces that grow in one or two months, versus a long duration crop would be that cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, et cetera, tomatoes. And I often get asked, how is it, well, let me, let me show a couple more examples. How is it that we choose which plants to put together? And really, more than anything else, we're actually looking at architecture. So with those brassicas that we have back here, we have the larger brassicas that are arching up and out, and then we have a wide head lettuce underneath so that they fit together nicely. Versus here, we've got leeks, and this is just having been transplanted. You've got our rows of leeks right here with the lettuces in between. And here, we're ready to harvest out these lettuces. And so here, we've got, we're creating hallways of leeks. So we're getting nice, tall, little mini romains that will fit nicely in that same structure. Um, and we will harvest out these mini romaine lettuces put down another layer of compost, hill up the leeks a little bit, and transplant a second crop of mini romaines in there. So we'll get two crops of mini romaines amongst one of, okay, he or says. Or three when we're good. Oh. But if you can grow a whole leek crop, a 100% leek crop, and simultaneously get three crops of mini romaine lettuce out of it, well, those mini romaine lettuces were worth more than the leeks anyway. So you've just doubled or tripled your revenue in that leek bed. Tomatoes will always have crops on them. And again, when you're planting those tomatoes, they're very small and they need to be every, you know, half meter or so. Um, and so we will put both sides of the beds fully in a quick crop. Here we've got some uh, endives. Here we've got some red butter lettuces. And we will often try to get two different successions in there. Then when we harvest that out, we'll actually put mulch on them and turn off the water. So then we will have dry farm tomatoes, which intensifies the flavor and makes them much nicer. Now, at, at, we don't actually have a picture of this, at the end of the tomato crop, right when we're trying to get in all of our winter crops to get them to grow up so that we can harvest them for Christmas, we will come back in and on the sides plant brassicas like cauliflowers while we are harvesting the last of the tomatoes until the frost kills them and we'll take out the tomatoes and the broccoli will already be larger in covering the soil and established. So we can take more advantage of more sunlight before it goes into the dark of winter. So we can get our brassicas well established just as the tomatoes are ending, always overlapping crops as we go. These tomatoes are usually put in the ground in the first two weeks of March. And then we begin harvesting our tomatoes by the end of May. Despite the fact that you saw, we usually have our last killing frost in early June. So we can often harvest field tomatoes before we have our last frost. It's a challenge, it's a real challenge, but yeah. all the frost blankets and covering. Super. Another one we just started last year, we grow a lot of brassicas. Brassicas are challenging because they do take a lot from the soil and there's some debate how much they actually feed the mycorrhizal communities in the soil. Um, and so we wanted to make sure to have bridge crops that were feeding the mycorrhizal fungi at the same time or just at least a very different crop. So we have tried and we love doing this um, when we transplant out a more narrow least spaced brassica, not the big um, cauliflowers, but maybe uh, broccolis or cabbages, we will seed fava beans. Now we're not using that just as a cover crop, we will actually harvest them, and you can see Anna and Sarah here with harvested bunches of the leaves. Um, you educate people, we've got a couple of restaurants, they love this as a you know, very light um, spring green. We give it out to our CSA members and we've got a second crop in there that's doing something very different. This is one, it's only a few weeks old and you can see all the nodules fixing nitrogen along there. We've got this at the same time that we've got the 100% crop cover of that broccoli or that cabbage or something else. And that is only a few weeks old and already nodulating. 
Something that we added this year was flowers, um, something we hadn't been very interested in doing the last several years. We wanted to feed people. Um, but we had these two farmers who've both worked with us for a long time, and they really pushed and came with a business plan to us. We want to do some flowers and do a CSA and so forth. So we said, great, we'll incubate that. You can try it. Um, it turned out to be really good. And we're actually very excited for several reasons. First of all, we have this movement. We're calling it the slow flower movement, um, not bringing in flowers from South America that are sprayed with God knows what, um, uh, but having them local, having them no-till, and we're really excited because the insects it brings in, the pollinators that it brings in, and it is a very different root structure than most of our vegetables. So these beds that had the flowers this year will not have flowers next year. They'll be in another place and we will rotate through a very, very different crop. Um, so we're excited about this for many different reasons. And it's pretty, too. <laughs> so back to the plant species diversity, it's also more than the crops. We get into the hedgerows and perennials and bed ends and fruit trees and ground covers. And we'll actually cover this a bit after our break. We're going to talk for about an hour and a half now, take a very short five or ten minute break, and then come back for the last 50 minutes or so. And we'll talk more about hedgerows and ecology then. But you can see, this is our roadway. And this is now early summer, and it hasn't rained in a few months. And our bed ends are also flowers or oregano, um, various flowers again. So we like to create a lot more diversity as well as a nice tree here on the very corner. A lot more diversity in our fields than just the um, vegetables. So here's another hedgerow. Uh, this diversity... Um, well, we want perennials in there as well as annuals. You know, 95% of our crops that we're harvesting and making money off of are annuals, and we want perennials in there too in that diversity of crops. But of course, in that same, you know, square meter, you can't have a perennial and then an annual and then a perennial. It doesn't work. So we like to get it in the same area. Now, for the ecology, it is so immensely important because this is our habitat for our beneficial insects as well as some of the beneficial animals on our property. Let's talk about that for a minute. So the beneficial insects insects, beneficial insects are our predators versus the ones who want to eat our crops. Those are the prey. Now, we don't understand insects quite as well as we understand mammals. So let me give you an analogy. Think about a bunny rabbit as a, you know, a, a pest in your garden and think about maybe a fox that might eat that. Now, the bunny rabbit has a shorter lifespan. It's smaller. It reproduces very quickly, right? Um, and you don't want it there. Uh, so on our farm, we could have many families of bunny rabbits living. They don't need very much space to live in. Now let's look at the fox. The fox has fewer babies, fewer kits, um, less frequently. It's physically a larger animal, and it needs more wild space. So we'd actually need a few of our farms to have a family of foxes. The same is true of the insects. The pest insects, they are going to live on our annual plants and feed there. They have a very short lifespan and they reproduce very rapidly. An aphid, for crying out loud, is born pregnant. It will only live for about a month. It's going to live right on your crop and it's gonna feed right there. Now the lady beetle who is going to eat that may live for a couple of years, has far fewer um, progeny and it needs to have a more stable habitat that it will then travel out to eat and then go back to a safe home afterwards. So your perennial bushes between, what, a half meter and two meters in height is the prime habitat for those beneficial insects. And our studies have shown that they will go out from those, help me, oh, 250 feet, but... 15, 80, and 100 meters, but mostly they'll go out only to where they find food. So if you only have hedgerow every 200 meters, well, they may not find the pest insects in the middle of the field. They may only go out five meters and find pests there. So we'll show you later in the second half how frequently we have hedgerows throughout the farm, but the, really the goal is this is how you support beneficial insects, which are your predators for pest control. And many other good things. Oh, oh, we... So this is actually a great uh, slide because to the left, about 10 meters, is the 60 hectare conventional vineyard. To the right, 15 meters or 20 meters is one of our fields. And we planted all of this in here. So it's creating this buffer between the conventional vineyard and us. 
And here's an example of all the hedgerows on our farm. We're going to look at the whole farm as a large organism. And this is starting up at the top of the property at the crust of the pie and well, working our way down to the tip. Along the top up here, we have all sorts of oaks. Um, over here is our house, so we have all sorts of plantings around our house, and we have some of our animals, so a lot of trees. Here. here is our very first hedgerow. We put that in on the day that we moved onto the property, so it's 14 years old. So you can see all the bed ends along bed here. Bed ends along here. Then we have more hedgerows, hedgerows at the bottom of this field. Hedgerow here. Hedgerow yep. here. Here are some new ones. This is the big one we were just looking at. Across. Another one across over there. Got hedgerows some... along the side between us and the vineyard. Yep. Got a hedgerow cutting through fields 8 and 10 right there. Um, More native plantings back here. We planted. There were hedgerows, hedgerows. <laughs> okay, okay. So, there we go. And, still keeps going. and then this one is our largest one um, in terms of height. We call it our green wall because it's also a spray barrier and a windbreak um, with our, our neighbor over yep. there. So just to give you an example of how many of those we have on the property. So that was a big one. Grows many different species of plants is Oof. practical. Keeping the soil covered all the time, right? Maximizing photosynthetic capture, maximizing sunlight so you can maximize root exudation. The best way to do that is with green living plants. You want to get tons of plants in there all the time and never have that bare soil exposed. And there's some nice bed ends along with our big <clears throat> tomato alleys and broccoli and flowered broccoli over here. But really, you want to maximize that green photosynthetic um, capture, the plant material. We do that by using very large transplants. We don't like to do seeding out in the fields very often, direct seeding. Transplants are a much better way to get more rapid growth so you can have um, sunlight capture and root exudation and protect and cover the soil. So some of the reasons that we do the transplants instead of direct seeding, um, you can see right here, I think one great one is always 100% crop cover. If the seed doesn't germinate in the nursery, well, you don't transplant it out in the field so that every bed in the field always has 100% crop cover because you only fill it with transplants. Also, if your plants are spending the first month of their life in the nursery before they go in the field, that means less time in the field. Less time in the field means more crops per year and less availability to pests because they're out in the fields less time. So one of our pest control measures is simply transplanting large, healthy plants so they're less um, time in the fields, and therefore, pests don't find them. Um, also, you're out competing weed seeds. So one of the main, and that's some of the big problems farmers often face, are pest management and weeds. And we tend not to have to worry much about pests or weeds on the farm. Uh, it's quite lovely to not have to worry about that and worry more about it. where do we sell all the food we're growing. So our nursery is super, super important to us, um, having good, healthy transplants that we can go out to the field. So these are just some lettuces that are about a, actually they're ready to go out in the field or they can wait a week. Um, you can see we actually use pretty large cell sizes. This allows for a flexibility in transplanting. We can get up to sort of a two week window of when the plant can transplant out, which is critical because maybe the right beds in the right field aren't ready yet. So you want to wait a little bit of time. And these plants, those could have been transplanted a week and a half ago. They're going out that day. They could also wait one more week before they went out. Larger cell sizes means stronger, healthier transplants and more flexibility in managing your nursery transition to your field. Here's transplants going out. You can see lettuces all laid out on their sides, some baby bok choy. Um, so you've spent... got really good soil cover on this instantaneously. You are cutting out a photosynthesizing plant and going straight into the next one in there, covering that soil. And if you have to direct seed, like carrots, beans, peas, spinach, a few other things, then we like to use an agricultural burlap to cover those beds. So these have just been direct seeded with either a carrot or spinach. And that burlap isn't really tight like a coffee sack. It's a little looser. And it allows for the soil to be kept at a um, warmer temperature and higher humidity so you can water it less. And we've, it really increased germination rates. We've got much higher germination rates and much more rapid germination timing with the burlap on there as a cover. And then of course, if you can't do all that, you can always mulch your beds as well and keep that soil covered and protected. But covering and protecting the soil is really critical. The biology in the soil doesn't want exposure to full sun and full wind, just like you don't. So really keeping that soil covered. Here we're um, straw mulching some of our broccoli for summer, because summer gets quite hot 
and the, the roots of the broccoli don't want a lot of heat like that. So we can really keep their feet cooler with straw mulch. And then we're just feeding the biology with all that straw that we're putting out into the field. If we cannot cover the ground either through green photosynthesizing plants, that's optimal, or an organic mulch, the third option is a plastic mulch. So we don't love this option, but we will use it um, uh, a couple of different ways. Mostly we'll use it in the winter when we're in the Persephone period, when you have fewer than 10 hours of daylight per day. You get out a large crop for Christmas. You don't want to put something right back in, cover it, and then the end, uh, beginning of February, we'll plant it out. And you could see Sam there was just pulling it up. And so you can see the residue. There was uh, some brassica here with large stems before. Those will all stay there. And we will prep the beds and put the next crop in right now. So um, this is a video from March. Come on, go. Um, just showing you lots of different ways. We've got strawberries here that do have plastic on them, and then they have mulch in the pathways. Here we've got some covering of beds. We've also got just one there. Sometimes we'll cover just the pathways if we're dealing with some beds there. We've also got straw mulch along the edges of the field. Uh, we've got lots of green ground cover here. All the beds are planted. Um, so those are ways that we will keep the soil covered all the time. Yay. Incorporating animals. This was always um, one that we struggled with. And in the beginning, we used to incorporate animals much more easily when we were tillage-based. We would just do a winter cover crop and then move the chickens into the cover crop field for winter, and it worked beautifully. But as we moved into a no-till system, it was more challenging to incorporate animals because you have to be concerned with food safety issues, um, with manures. And finally, we had a woman, an entomologist, out visiting our farm for a farm tour, and we had a 20-person farm tour, and we start at the beginning, give the introduction, then we begin the farm tour down the fields. And we realize this woman is actually still back at the beginning, on her belly, in the grass, in the roadway, just staring at the ground. Well, we kind of offer for her to come join us, and she just, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. We go on an hour and a half farm tour, come back, and she's still in the same spot, laying on the ground. She's like, you wouldn't believe the amazing beetles I saw in your grass, and spiders. You have so much life in your grass. All these guys are adding to your animal life on your farm, and they're going out in your fields and eating all sorts of pest insects. They're moving soil around. The point is that we can get a lot of other ways of managing animals on the farm without those animals being cows or sheep or goats. Include your songbirds, your snakes, your voles, all your insect life, your beetles, your spiders, etc. We're, we're showing pictures of hedgerows here uh, because those really are bringing in that biology. Some of these hedgerows here. Um, we have a lot of snakes and we love our snakes. First couple of years with tillage, you would cut the, through these guys and you didn't have very many. With a no-till system and the hedgerows, they love it under there. What do these guys control? Voles field mice, even baby gophers. That's fantastic. Um, so lots of life. Um, we have turtles. Um, those are native bees, birds. Um, as much life as we can. This is Miguel. Um, he was from Mexico, from an area, um, and they hated snakes. He came to the property, and Paul would be like, great, look, there's a snake. And he would be all the way over there. He, Miguel got to have the job of trapping. We still do trap some of our voles and our gophers and things like that. And once he recognized how these guys were his friends, he started calling them his compañeros. And so one day I was talking to him and I'm like, you know, well, we're going to put beets down there. Um, I know there's been a lot of voles. Could you maybe get ahead of it and start trapping some voles down there? And he said, Elizabeth, no, mis compañeros have been helping me down there. And I'm like, my Spanish is pretty good, but what am I missing here? And finally, I got to understand he was seeing snakes, realizing that was an area that had a lot of rodents, picking them up and taking them to where there was more food. So um, we love our snakes. We love our hawks. We love our birds, um, all of that. And then another way that we are incorporating um, animals on the farm is through their manures. Um, so we get several different kinds of manure, um, you know, from off the farm that we bring in and Remix add to our composts. Compost. Yeah, so you can see here there's a lot of our animal, there's some old eggplants and brassicas, but there's also some old compost, and then we will mix it with manure as we're making our compost. So those are our principles. Not our principles. Those are the principles that we'd like to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going? Okay. Oh, yeah. Super. Yeah, um, that's the first half. 
So many versions of this quote have been said this morning already, and this is just my favorite version of um, how to say this, that life improves the capacity of the environment to sustain life. The more life you have, the more resilient it becomes, and the more able it is to have yet more life. So desert environments are very fragile for a reason. But if you can create an absolute abundance of life on your farm, with your hedgerows, with being no-till and taking care of your soil biology, you can create this vast amount of life on your farm that just allows more life to thrive. It's just a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle. This is the meat and potatoes now of how we apply the principles to farming. So those five principles really come down to transitioning a bed from one crop to the next. Because of course, you do start a field at some point, you have to make no-till beds and make a no-till field. We're not gonna talk about that, because it, that you do one time. Transitioning happens every single day of the week, every single week of the year. We're always transitioning crop to crop to crop. So just really quickly, first you have to clear the prior crop that was there. You might broad fork, although we don't right now anymore. Um, you might apply some organic fertilizers or compost. Then you will transplant and you will water and cover in and continue on. So the first one, taking out the prior crop, clearing the beds, we are not going to pull that out because that is going to be opening the soil. If we have the soil surface right here, we want to cut it right at the soil surface or even better if we can, just slightly below. So you can see here, this is a kale crop and even though it was flowering, it was still had delicious leaves, so we were continuing with it. This was like a maybe a March picture. This was overwintered. Marty has some big loppers, big shears that he's using to cut it right below the soil surface. And then all of this is going to go to the compost pile. But remember, there's more biomass below ground, right? That's we, what's going to be just feeding all that biology in there. So then once so, you And we want to keep all that rhizosphere right in place. So once you removed all the biomass from the surface of the soil and left the soil undisturbed, then you come back and if you need to, you can broad fork the bed or you can rake it out to make it flat. But we found that raking out the top of the bed is about like tilting and it blows out your soil. It removes the nitrogen and carbon and makes the soil very friable and really kills the biology. So we don't like to rake our beds. And the broad fork, we only used as a transition tool to go from tillage to no-till. Once we've been no-till for a few years, we just don't need the broad fork anymore. So our earliest fields that we switched over to no-till, they haven't seen a broad fork in seven years, but they've had on the order of 20, 30, 40 crops per bed without any broad fork in that time. So, so really what happens next after you've removed the above ground biomass is you come back and apply organic fertilizers as needed and compost as needed. It's not every time um, and it's not a lot every time. This is a nice high contrast picture. It looks like a lot. We're putting on about a centimeter or less of compost per bed and that's a maximum application, not a minimum. Um, we can certainly do less, but it's always as needed. And we'll make that decision based upon what was the crop that was in there? Was it a heavy feeder like a brassica? Was it in there a long time like Brussels sprouts or tomatoes or something like that? Um, or was it a light feeder? Are we taking out you know, a little Napa cabbage and we're gonna put in a lettuce? Um, if we're doing a transition like that, we might not do anything. We'll just clear out the prior crop. While we're clearing it out, we we'll pull a couple of weeds and transplant in the next crop. But so, for example, we frequently will have a last, our very last cucumber crop will go in the ground around August 1st. We'll prep the bed with compost and organic fertilizers for that cucumber crop, and then it's killed in the hoop house by end of October um, with the frosts and the fungus and everything else. When we clear out the cucumber plants at the end of October, we'll do zero compost and zero fertilizers and go back in with not just one lettuce crop, but a second lettuce crop in December and a third lettuce crop in February until that one comes out in March, and then we prep the bed again for a summer squash crop for the summertime. So that one application of organic fertilizers and compost in August is good enough for the cucumber crop and three more lettuce crops afterwards. You want to talk about fertilizers? Okay, they're going to have different. Yeah, and then transplanting. Child labor always helps. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, and then you water in by hand to really settle the roots and settle the plants. And also that's a great time to walk back over it and make sure you did it right. And then you cover the beds as needed, whether it's frost blankets against um, birds or frost or wind 
Um, or you have some netting against birds or deer or anything else. So a lot of covering for a lot of different reasons. And here we have, you may have seen this before, it's uh, John, Mikey, and Karen, three people, and they're gonna transition four 85 foot long beds. So 25 meter beds. And it takes about a 45 minutes for three people to do all four beds. And you can see we have the crops that are standing here. Um, these are all overwintered kales and overwintered mustards. This is done in about mid-April. And here we are clearing all the above ground biomass. And all that's gonna go out to the compost pile. Some are being cut off with loppers, some with harvest knives, depending on the size of the stem. Once it's all being hauled off the compost pile, the irrigation lines are put off. Calcium, feather meal, compost goes on. It's about two and a quarter wheelbarrows per 85 foot bed at this point. We're less now. You can see the bed ends still have the flowers in them. That hasn't changed. Now we're, oh, coffee break. <laughs> and you can see we're actually doing cauliflower, Romanesca cauliflower, intercropped with the lettuce crop. So we're actually multi-cropping in all of these beds. So we're gonna have that big, huge Romanesca cauliflower crop sometime in June, but the lettuces will come out in May. And as, in the meantime, water in, done. <laughs> So all the carbon and biology that these plants helped support in the ground without any soil disturbance is going to help these next ones thrive. And that's really what we're aiming to do with each of our crop transitions. And those bed transitions are happening every single week of the year, every single week of the year, nonstop. <clears throat> and I want to mention at this point, just so I don't forget, that people have asked us, well, how do you get such high organic matter? Is it because of all the compost you've applied? And it's not. We've done, some <clears throat> we've done some calculations with some soil scientists. And if you look at the top, we've tested our soil down one meter and looked at the organic matter level in all the different layers down one meter. And if you account for all the compost that we've added onto the farm, less than a quarter of our organic matter increase is attribu attributable to the compost. More than three quarters of the increase in soil organic matter is based on those five principles. Those five principles are the key to success. Compost is just one tool in your toolbox. You have thousands of tools. It's only one tool. This is just another example. We've got three people here, um, and they're going to take out this crop of uh, tot soy. Uh, it was about two-thirds harvested, and then the rest bolted before, flowered before we were able to get to it. And this is so, about a 20-minute time lapse. Yeah, so they're cutting it out, um, putting down the compost again. It is a lot faster. <laughs> and done. So 20 minute transition, just boom, done. Go on to the next set of beds, next set of beds, next set of beds, and keep moving around the farm after you've done harvest in the morning and before you do any other nursery work in the afternoon. Yep. So very fast. Okay. So sort of wrapping all of that up a little bit, um, you know, sort of the things that are very important to us and that all work off of each other. First of all, no tillage of any sort on the farm. Um, once the beds are established. Second, we are very intensive. And one of the things we really say to new farmers is start with less than you think you can do and do it really well. Because if you are intensive and you're not letting the weeds come in, you're not letting the soil sort of volatize because nothing's happening in it, but you're taking one productive crop, immediately getting it out, getting the next one out, immediately taking that one out, the next one in, having that multi-cropped, the more intensive you can be, Yes, you are feeding yourself, feeding your community more, you are making more money, but you are also feeding the soil more, and so helping the whole system. So being intensive is an imperative. It is super important. And then also the ecology, both the above ground ecology and the below ground. Coming back to Paul's quote, life sustains the capacity for more life. Great. So last little bit here before we take a little break. And we wanted to sort of talk about this regenerative agriculture for a changing climate. And we've, hopefully we're all moving beyond the word sustainable, because sustainable is like the lowest common denominator. How do we just barely get by without hurting things? That's not good enough on planet Earth anymore. We have harmed planet Earth so much that we need to regenerate the damage. We need to undo that damage and regenerate the life systems on this planet. And with that changing climate, we have all kinds of challenges, and we're seeing it on our farm absolutely every single day. In fact, as we just said, we had minus five this morning, and then on Sunday, tomorrow, 
Um, we're going to have like two or three inches of rain. Another, yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. have another seven centimeters of rain coming. So just a couple of examples and how we have seen having really healthy soil and a regenerative system with perennials and annuals help us with this. Because yeah, we want to farm to sequester carbon and get it out to fight climate change, but we also have to deal with climate change. So it's sort of that we have to deal with climate change and how can the healthy soil help us out with that. So. Um, you know, one of the things that we have is frost, and we heard an awesome presentation this morning um, about farming in the cold, and we've been trying to tell this to our neighbors for a long time. Yes, you actually can grow stuff, and look at this kale, it's covered in frost, and look at these Brussels sprouts, they're covered in frost, and they will repair themselves um, if you manage them well, and if you let the soil be healthy and feed them. We've actually found that, um you know, on our drought winters, when there's no rainfall, there's no cloud cover, and we freeze a lot more. It's much colder in drought winters for us because there's no cloud cover. And we can spend seven weeks down in the teens. So we can spend seven weeks that winter with temperatures minus six or lower. And that's really hard on plants, we thought. So when it wasn't a drought winter, when there's lots of rain, we thought, oh, good, this is wonderful. If we have more rain, it won't be as cold. The problem with more rain is more clouds, less sunlight. And we have found that actually the rainy winters with less sunlight are far more challenging for our plants than the freeze. The frost is nothing. They can shrug that off and keep growing. So it's really a matter of how do you manage the plants for optimal health. And yes, a high soil organic matter means high organic, uh, and high biology in the soil means you have more nutrient exchange, which is more resources for that plant to fight against the frost and stay healthy and functioning Plus, higher organic matter means a darker colored soil. Darker colored soil pulls in more sunlight, stays warmer longer. Warmer soil has higher biological activity. It's all a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle. Little hoop house in the winter, we have a bed covered because we couldn't plant anything into it. And then a couple beds black covered. And then a couple beds with frost blankets, heavy ones. And then some carrots come along, I think. Droughts. So we definitely have had some uh, pretty serious droughts in these years. <laughs> this year, we actually had two artificial droughts, we're calling them. One, in August, our well pump went out when we were having a week of temperatures in the high 30s, degrees centigrade. Um, that was not so fun. And then... Seven days with 35 degrees or 34 and 35 degrees centigrade. No, 35 to 38 degrees centigrade. Yeah, exactly. Temperatures, no um, water. And then just this November, we had fires that were up to about uh, 20 kilometers away from our place, and the power company uh, cut off all the power. And the weather that created those fires had um, shifts in temperature of... That was from 30, 35 we, down to negative 1 to 34 yes. to negative 2. Every day. And we had no power to and do no any water. irrigation, which irrigation would have helped those plants um, in that time. So um, I guess what I'm saying is having droughts, having that healthy soil, our plants were had a stronger immune system and were more robust and able to work with it. We also have to have infrastructure. You're seeing Anna and I right here on our um, pump siphoning out water so because we had no power so that we could water our nursery. We used our ponds, infrastructure that we've had put into our property so that we could use that water with a gas pump to water our fields. So, but think about it, because the last rainfall was April, early April. This is now November before it's rained yet. It hasn't rained since early April. So we've only had irrigation water going since early April, and now we have no water in the fields. The soil's really bone dry. We were unable to water the fields for five or six days. Plants shrugged, didn't bother them. They just kept growing, not an issue. The only challenge was the nursery. But the organic matter in the soil had a higher water holding capacity and a water, higher water use efficiency rate with the plants. So the plants got by just fine without that irrigation after however many months of no rainfall and really dry soil. I've, we've seen two different studies that have looked at with a one percentage point increase. Now, I'm going to have to deal with all the numbers now. With a one percentage point increase in soil organic matter, an acre of land can hold an additional, one scientist said 16,000, and another said 70,000 gallons of plant available water. I'm not going to do all the math to translate the, that. I'm sorry. But that's for one percentage point increase. And we've gone from two to eight. So multiply that by six. So that's how much more water the, uh, the soil is able to hold. But conversely, 
also how it is able to hold air. So when we have floods on our property, which happens pretty much every year, one drought winter, we had no floods. Um, and when most we, winters, we have four to seven floods in our bottom fields. Yeah. Um, the soil is also able to hold air so that the plants don't drown. Um, and that is because of the higher soil organic matter. So we this- We actually had a neighbor around the corner to the right who was farming the same soil, same vegetables, but they were organic tillage and not no-till. And they had the similar floods in their fields, and they were on the phone with us the next day. They were very scared. They said we had to harvest everything because it was all dying in the fields. There was no oxygen left in the soil, and all the plants were just anemic and dying for the whole week after those floods. We had zero crop loss from floods. Zero crop loss, unless they go under, in which case you can't harvest because of waterborne bacteria. But plants just with the soggy soil, not a problem at all when you have high organic matter. It can hold that water and still have space for the oxygen for the plants to breathe. So these are some beets that had just been transplanted. This was a very late flood that we had. We weren't expecting it this late. And you could see this was when it was starting to flood. It ended up covering the entire bed. And then once it receded, yes, the irrigation lines are a little messy. Um, and you've got some mulch that floated in. Um, but the plants continued just fine. Um, OK, so this is us, Northern California. California goes about like this. Here is a San Francisco Bay Area. We are about there. Um, so this was our fires uh, a, year and a, a year ago um, and the smoke that we had as a result. Um, the fire nearby is definitely bad. The smoke means that you cannot be working out there. Um, we have our, our workers and ourselves all working with masks and so forth. Um, the but there problem, has, okay. The other problem with the smoke is it blocks the sunlight and puts you into a deep freeze mode. And then by eight o'clock at night, you're already below zero and you don't come up back above zero until noon the next day. So all of a sudden you only have seven or eight hours a day when you have a, above freezing temperatures and it really harms the plants from a lack of sunlight and a lack of warmth and the biology as well. But again, oh. healthy, robust soil biology was able to counteract that and our plants kept growing, no issue, no problem. Um, then ash, um, a fire we had uh, the year prior to this that was very close to our farm and burned a lot of structures. We had customers, and actually I myself was really, really concerned because a lot of those structure fires may have had lead in them, and, and we were finding pages of recipe books in, the, in our fields and leaves from trees we didn't have in our little area. Um, and you know, I was saying, wait, how do we know that our food is safe to harvest? We have this ash falling out of the sky. Um, and did a lot of research. Thankfully, one of the women who works part-time on our farm is also a soil scientist that helps clean up brown sites. And what I found, and a lot of other people in our community have found, is what would you do to remediate that soil, to help that soil be healthy again? You would add compost, increase the soil organic matter, and inoculate with fungi. Well, what are we doing already in our soil? We're increasing our soil organic matter. We're making sure that we have a high level of fungi in there. So again, by having healthy biology, healthy soil, we're able to be resilient when we have a lot of these problems. That was so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so in the very beginning, when the very beginning, it had the mi micro farming, right? It was the micro farming conference. Well, <clears throat> but we're all farmers. It doesn't matter your scale. We're all farming and we're all feeding our communities. It is such an important thing to remember. Don't put ourselves down by saying only we're small micro farmers. So this really goes to industrial versus smallholder. I'm gonna get out of the way so you can take a photo in a second. But why don't you start on the bottom and work your way up? Well, I'm actually gonna talk about it first. This is just an infographic. It comes from a report by a group called the ETC. It's an international group um, from outside the United States. Um, and the report itself is called, Who Will Feed Us? The Peasant Food Web versus the Industrial Food Chain. Um, They're constantly adding more uh, information and uh, the uh, the resources for this is as long as actually the written material. So it's a great report. Um, this is just easy and nice to show you. Uh, so small uh, holders generally have uh, one to two hectares or less um, versus industrial. Um, now this is what, especially people in the United States, but also you know in the global north, we don't see as much. 70% of the world's produce is actually produced by small holders. That's not what we're led to believe, is it? 
We're led to believe it's these guys who have the huge machines and all the chemicals and all of that sort of stuff, but that's not true. They're only producing 30%, but they're using 80% of the natural resources to produce that 30%. Versus the small shareholders, they're using a lot more human labor, right? So 20% of the natural resources used, not as much land, not as much petrol, not as many fertilizers and, and so forth and so on. So that goes to calories obtained for every calorie expended. Same thing like in the presentation this morning, the industrial, um, you know, 1.5 calories obtained for every calorie expended versus over here, 15 calories received for every calorie expended. Oh. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. That was fun. The next one that I love seeing is uh, almost double the women, uh, number of women farmers on this side, the small shareholders. And look at this, over 2 million different varieties produced over here versus a very small number of varieties on the other side. So I think this is really excited. We need small farmers. We need them you know, in our neck of the woods. We need you all um, to continue what you're doing. Oh, Sorry, oops. I did a little editing last night and I forgot to remove that one. Um, so many of these numbers uh, we said in the beginning of our, our presentation, but I'll come back to it again. Some of the same oh, ideas. 120. So that's supposed to be... 120,000 yeah. euros per hectare per year. I have obviously went on to edit something else before finishing. Okay, so, so our year. fields are about 1.1 hectares. The total property is about 3.5. It's about, don't look at this, 220,000 euros per field hectare per year. Um, our employees, we have about nine. This is full-time equivalents. I don't know if you all use that, but okay, great. Full-time equivalents in August and January, it's down to about four. About 45% of our food goes to our 140 year-round CSA families. About 45% goes to our farmer's markets. We have two that go year-round and one that is just seasonal. 8% to, to our restaurants and then two to our food hub. So 98% of our food within 25 kilometers. And this is, was our crew for this goes. year. That's where all the revenue goes from our food, <clears throat> is to our community, our farmers. Um, we love this. This is why we do it, is to train new farmers and to have this family of farmers that can help <clears throat> grow food for our community. Um, and they're always changing over because we constantly are sending them out in the world to go start their own farms, which is really awesome. Casey is starting a no-till farm in Japan. Tommy just had his last day last week, and he is going to start a no-till farm in Arizona. Um, we had three farmers that left our farm last year. Um, they're doing their own things this year. Really exciting. So speaking of farms elsewhere, we actually have a number of farmers who have taken our model and adapted it to their conditions and had as good a success or better than us. And that's always a really awesome thing is it's no miracle of Singing Frogs Farm in our location, but people are using our model in other climates and having higher returns per acre than we are and better organic matter returns. So this is a good example. Go for it. Uh, this is Two Roots Farm. It's in Carbondale, Colorado. They are at 8,000 feet elevation. What's the meters on that? 20, 2,500 meters. Um, uh, so they are quite cold. Um, the, these are our friends. You actually saw uh, Mikey and Karen in uh, the, the video transplanting. Um, and they, the last two years, have their own farm, which is Mossy Willow Farm, which is in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and we love seeing pictures of it because it looks just like our farm, but, but they different. Do, they do need more hedgerows still. <laughs> We're going to talk to them that, about that. It takes a few years to grow. And this is just the beginning. They're just the beginning. They're starting. Uh, this is Michael and Shannon. Um, they are at about 2,000 feet elevation, so about, about 700 meters elevation in California. Uh, so they get both much hotter than we do, and they also do get snow. Um, and they are in the process of putting in hedgerows. They're, they're very successful in about their fourth year. This is them again. Um, and then this is Terra Vida, which is also in Colorado, also at 7,000 feet elevation. Um, and this is him. He is doing a most of the year CSA. He goes through January and then starts up again in May. Um, and this is the end of his season, their season. And you can actually see, 
I'm sorry, there we go. You can actually see uh, they have all sorts of beds there that are just prepped and then we'll go through the winter like that and then be ready early spring to jump start so in into March their next year. So in March or early April, when he can see some clear weather coming, he can go out there and whip the snow off the blankets, pull the blankets off the beds, kick the snow aside, transplant, put some frost blankets back over and let those plants grow through those late spring snows while his friends are all still waiting to till their fields for another month or two. So he's harvesting when his competitors are just beginning to plow the fields and thinking about starting to sow seeds. And then there's ours. So we need more pictures. So if you have something and it's successful, we need to get your picture up here as well. Oh, this is packing our CSA, just to end on something fun. Um, about 140 boxes there. Um, on a Wednesday morning in maybe July or something like that. And it was tomato harvest day for sure. <laughs> Wonderful rainbow of our heirloom tomatoes going into pulp containers. For those CSAs. And that is it. We would... <laughs> <laughs>